And so, um, yeah, my presentation will be about behavioral interventions that we developed to increase household waste segregation in a particular area uh, of the city of Bogor in, in Indonesia. Next slide, please. So sometimes that um, sometimes I get asked, um, is it really worth it to tackle behavior change, to try and change behavior? It's difficult. People used to 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 stick to their behaviors um, and is also a long term effort. Yeah? So is it really worth it? Why um, should we not just just try to introduce end of pipe technical solutions? Yeah? Now take the mixed waste and then um, extract the materials that can still be recycled. And I think there are three good reasons to um, actually try and change behavior. The first is um, if we look at the value chain of recyclables, not just plastics, but also um, such materials as, say, paper or other materials, <clears throat> the households are the first link in that chain. And if that link does not, um, does not function properly, or if, if in that link uh, materials are being contaminated or lost, then they are lost for the entire chain. Yeah? So I think um, addressing households and addressing their behaviors and trying to change these behaviors is worth it simply from a material uh, and value chain perspective. Then second, um, if we look at technological solutions, they might be suitable for some countries. Yeah, where labor is expensive and capital is relatively cheap, such as Germany, for example. Still, we have a system in place where households separate their waste. But um, in other countries, it makes even more sense yeah, because their sorting is done manually. And if you imagine, I've been to, to a waste separation plant where most of the waste, waste arrived mixed. Yeah, so food waste, for example, was mixed with um, with uh, PET, with PET bottles, and then you can imagine the the working conditions in that plant. So very quickly, um, it's not just an environmental issue or a material value issue. Um, it's also a social issue and a safety issue, a health issue for the workers in the plant. So that would be a second strong argument for um, doing the separation of the waste, in particular. Um, the parts of the waste that are valuable and can be recycled from the parts of the waste that are potentially a hazard for the workers in the plant, such as food waste, but also, um, for example, medical waste or uh, hygiene products. And then third of all, I think um, waste separation is part of a more general mindset change. And we will need that mindset change uh, and, and behavioral change. <clears throat> towards sustainability. And I think thinking about waste separation and creating awareness about, um, about waste, what happens to our waste and how does our behavior impact waste and sustainability more broadly, um, I think is, is an exercise that we can't get around. We have to do it. And so I think these three arguments are quite strongly in favor of um, trying to tackle this long-term and complex issue of behavioral change, not just uh, regarding waste separation behaviors, but all sustainability behaviors. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, and the one finding that we always um, have is there is no one size fits all solution to changing behavior. Now, a solution that might work very well in one context might not work at all in, in a different context. Um, however, there is a process that we follow usually um, at IDOS when we work together with partners on, on the ground. And there are several steps that uh, we try to go through um, to actually develop interventions that are successful in, um, in reaching behavioral change. And so the first of these steps is together with the partners, we try to find out what is the overarching aim. Now, so often the partners already have a kind of intervention in mind, but um, we like to take a step, a step back with them and ask, okay, what do you want to achieve? And say, for example, that could be um, as an overarching aim, closing the plastics loop in some region, region X. Okay. 
so then we have the, the, the overarching aim defined. Um, the next step would be understanding the status quo. What is currently happening? Because we always enter an existing system with existing actors, with existing infrastructure, with established behaviors. And we need to understand that system to be able to understand what parts of the system do we need to change to close, for example, the plastics loop. Huh? And in the other sessions, we've already talked about um, all the different elements of the system. And we need to think about all of the different elements of that system to be able to, um, to, to design a new system that works in the way that we want it to. And one aspect could indeed be behavioral change. Yeah? So in that aspect, we need to understand what do people currently do? Uh, and why do they do that? And the next, we need to understand what do we need them to do? Yeah, so how does the new behavior, the target behavior, need to look like so that this can contribute to the new system that closes the plastics loop? And then as a, as a, as a fourth step, we can try to develop targeted interventions that enable and motivate the people to um, shift from their current behavior to the new behavior, the target behavior. Then fifth, it is always very useful to test our interventions before we scale them up, because sometimes we can have quite surprising results. Yeah? So test and improve the interventions. And then on the, in, the, in the sixth step, we would scale them up um, to, to a larger population or to other areas or what have you. And I would like to go into a bit more detail uh, in, in each of those steps. Next slide, please. Many thanks. So first of all, finding out what our overarching aim is. It's not always simple. Uh, sometimes we really need some iterations with the partners to find out what the overarching aim really is, what the most pressing issue is. And then once we have that overarching aim defined, we like to think from the end. Yeah. So this is our overarching aim. What are con the conditions and the potential interventions that we need to, um, to achieve that overarching aim? And sometimes it can help, for example, to establish a theory of change, to think about the entire system um, that can help us and that is necessary to achieve our overarching aim. It also supports thinking out, outside the box. Yeah, so maybe we already have some have something in mind, but then we, we might find, oh, other changes in the system might help us better to achieve our overarching aim. Yeah, so always think about what is the easiest to reach, the most efficient, the most effective, or sometimes also um, things that have most co-benefits, maybe co-benefits in terms of uh, social uh, benefits, uh, including uh, the informal sector, for example. Which solutions might have the most political buy-in? Now, these are all aspects that we need to, to understand. And it supports also this, the kind of systems thinking that we um, tried to use in our project and um, that is actually necessary because what we're, what we're trying to do is establish a new system where all the different elements need to work together so that the entire system can function. Um, yeah, well, as I already said, our pilot project um, tried to include actors that um, had a good position in all links in the chain uh, from the households uh, through to the sales then in the end of plastic recyclers on the global market. Next slide, please. Okay, so the first thing that we needed to do once we had established that changing household behavior is an important uh, element in our system was understanding the status quo. So we had a, or we have a pilot region, a pilot area, uh, which is Telaga Karipan residence uh, in Indonesia. And understanding the status quo is a bit of a detective work. So uh, we like to go along the questions of uh, what who, how, and why. So what exactly is our issue? Our issue in that area um, was that um, we had a, a separation plan, we had a waste collection, but they only um, uh, 
collect mixed waste. And so it's it's only possible to recycle a fraction. And of course, um, the exposed separation process is not a very pleasant one when we receive mixed waste. OK, next question was who causes that problem? Of course, the households are in that area, but households as such often is not enough. We need to really delve deeply into um, is it a specific group of households? So, for example, uh, let's say uh, the higher income households are causing a lot of specific waste that, that we don't want to see in the fraction of recyclables. Um, who in the household is in charge for waste management? Who, for example, would take the decision that a household starts to separate their waste and who then implements it? Are there maybe, for example, household employees that have to implement that decision? Yeah, so who in the household do we really uh, have to reach with our intervention and how can we do that? And then next up, we had to understand how do they currently treat their waste? What do they do? Um, with their waste in the home. And if it's possible, uh, we need to understand every step. So for example, I have a, a waste item in my hand. What exactly is it that I do with it? For example, I go into the kitchen, I throw it into a bucket. In the bucket, there's a plastic bag. And then when the plastic bag is full, I take that bag and I put it outside in some kind of container. So in every step, there could be a barrier to the new target behavior. Yeah, so it is really necessary to understand every step. For example, um, I put the waste in the bucket in my kitchen. The question would be, um, if I now start waste separation, is there space for a second bucket? If there is not, then we, as uh, the ones who want to change behavior, need to think about offering a solution that works for that household so that they can circumvent that space issue. So, for example, providing a hook that they can hang somewhere in the kitchen for a bag where they can collect the recyclables. Huh? Um, and then fourth, we need to understand why do people do what they do yeah? so that we can develop a solution ideally together with them that meets their needs ideally better than the current solution. And in each of these questions, we need to prioritize. Yeah? So what is the most pressing issue? Which group is mainly responsible for causing that issue? What are the main reasons for their status quo behavior? So that we can really address the right group of people with the right kind of intervention. And um, in our uh, case in Indonesia, uh, the status, status quo was that people uh, collect their waste um, and then they have a kind of, uh, let's say, a waste tunnel in their um, outside uh, wall. Yeah, um, they can access that tunnel from the inside and they can put their waste uh, into that tunnel. And then from the outside, there's another door and from that door it's being collected. Yeah? So we had to work with that uh, current solution and try to establish um, uh, uh, an alternative solution <clears throat> that allows people to get rid of their waste um, in a differentiated way. Next slide, please. So next up, we needed to understand the target behavior. What do we need people to do? Yeah. And there again, we need to think through the entire behavioral chain. So every step in the behavior. Yeah. And for example, that could mean um, what we need people to do was, for example, buy a second bucket. Yeah. There again, we need to think about, OK, what would be the price of such a bucket? Is it a hassle to buy such a second bucket? Do they have space in their kitchen? Yeah, so all, all of these aspects could be a barrier. And then they have to put the waste in these separate buckets. So barriers could be knowledge. What kind of waste do I have to put into which kind of bucket? Of course, another barrier could be motivation. Do I even want to? Yeah, why would I want to do that? Then next step, they have to, once the, the bucket is full, they have to um, dispose of the waste in these buckets in the respective containers. Yeah, not throw it all in one container because then again, it gets mixed. Yeah, so the question here would be, is there a second container available 
for the recyclables? Do people know that it is available? Is it convenient to bring the waste there? If it's in the next street, maybe that's already too much hassle. And then we need to provide them with the motivation. Why would they do what we want them to do? Now, we can't force them and we shouldn't force them. So we need to offer a better option. And there, factors that come into play are, of course, convenience. We all need our waste management to be convenient. Yeah? Um, so societal values. Sometimes we have um, uh, a context where uh, the concern for the environment is already very established, but sometimes not. Yeah? So we need to work with what we have. Cost is always a factor. The avail availability of, of uh, sustainable behavioral options, knowledge about the right behavior, trust, uh, that my uh, behavior change actually achieves something. Uh, these are all factors that play a key, key role here. Next slide, please. And once we've understood all that, the current behavior and also the target behavior, then we can go and develop interventions. Uh, and that could be changes in infrastructure, for example, setting up uh, um, uh, containers where people can uh, dispose of their recyclables. That could be a change in institutions. So, for example, a change in waste collection schedules. That could be communication measures. Huh? And with these interventions, we should address the main barriers and the main motivators for behavior change in our given context. Um, of course, everything needs to be context specific, but there are also some general guidelines. So the new behavior should be simple. Yeah, so it's, it should be easy to understand everything or the complex rules. Forget about it. Make it easy. So in our case, we had um, uh, separation rules just separate into two fractions. That's complex enough. Yeah, the recyclables and the materials that cannot be recycled. So this people, of course, have to understand in the first place. Uh, what can be recycled and what cannot not be recycled. Try to keep communication short and as simple and easy as possible. Minimize additional hassle. As I said, if the, the container for the recyclables is in the next street, that can already be too much hassle. I don't want that. I just want to get rid of it as I'm used to in ideally the wall of my, um, of my uh, yard. Yeah? So maximize convenience, of course, with an eye on cost. Yeah? Not all the convenient co uh, options can be financed, but within the possible maximize convenience. Then it should be attractive. In terms of money, we can't always use that lever, but we can try to, but also in non-monetary terms. Yeah? So for example, giving people a kind of warm glow for doing something good. Be it for the environment, be it for the future of the children, be it for the workers in the, in the waste separation plant. Something that connects with people. Creating trust. Uh, that is something that I, I very often hear in Germany. Yeah, I separate my waste, but, you know, I sometimes don't bother because anyways, they mix it together afterwards. Yeah. So the trust that my behavior change actually achieves something that the people then who are responsible for the later steps are doing their job is vital. Because if I don't trust that, then why would I do it? We can try to make it fun through gamification. Huh? Um, and then third, try to make it social. So we as humans, we are social animals. Yeah? We try to, to follow the behaviors of the group, uh, in particular, uh, the behavior of our peers, now, the people who are important to us, the people we look up to, the people we want to look good in front of. Yeah, we all have that. Um, and, and also um, use the fact that we as humans, we are wired for cooperation. We like to cooperate. Yeah? And we can use that to, to um, make that, let's say, that exercise a collaborative one. Yeah, because protecting the environment is a collaborative effort and making people feel that they are part of a group effort 
uh, can be something very powerful. Next slide, please. So the concrete interventions that we developed for our case in Indonesia were um, four, four interventions. Ah, they should be numbered one, two, three, four. Anyways, um, so first of all, we um, created enabling conditions for people to actually dispose of their waste in uh, in a differentiated differentiated way. So what we did, or uh, Better, better said, uh, what SACA uh, uh, organized uh, with their uh, organization Waste for Change, um, that they, they distributed second bins. Yeah? And they placed the second bins in front of the homes next to the existing bin so that um, there was as little as possible hassle for the households um, to change their behavior. Yeah, so they were enabled to um, do differentiated uh, waste disposal, and it was as easy, as simple, as hassle-free as possible. Then the second intervention, we created trust. Yeah, so before there was a waste truck and it went round and it just collected all of the waste, uh, it was, was thrown into the same truck, and we knew we needed to change that. So what we did was um, we put uh, uh, posters on the outside of the truck that um, first of all reminded people of the two different waste categories and also made it visible that this truck does not just mix it all together again but that there are two different compartments in that truck for organic and residuals uh, the, the green poster and for inorganics the blue poster and we, um, we put a separating wall between the compartments and we made it just a little bit higher than the, the outside walls of the truck so that people from the outside could see there's a, a separating wall in that truck. And there are actually two separated compartments. And um, we also painted the separating wall in a flashy color so that it kind of sprang into people's eyes that there is a separating wall and there is a differentiated collection. And then, of course, in the in the um, collection process, the one bucket for the uh, mixed waste is thrown into the, the green compartment and the other bucket is thrown into the other compartment so that people can actually see uh, on a day-to-day -day basis what happens with their waste after they hopefully correctly separated it. And then the fourth, um, uh, the, the third, so the, the, the third intervention, we try to motivate people to engage in this collaborative effort. You can see the flyer there. Of course, you can't read what is on the flyer, but this flyer, first of all, um, explains the separation process and also gives the information about what materials and so on and so forth, what happens to the materials and, and so on. And then it gives... Um, it, it kind of creates a, a let's let's win a prize together spirit. Yeah. So um, our idea is to increase the, the waste separation rate, the participation rate of households from the current um, about 34 percent, which is already a great success, to 60 percent. Yeah? And if people reach that aim, 60 percent of households participating in the recycling effort, then we will throw a community party. Yeah, and we we have uh, some nice prizes to win at that party, and it will be a community event to um, kind of stay in that spirit of community effort. So that is the the kind of social element to motivate people to join that effort. And then the fourth uh, intervention is a sticker. Together with that flyer, we distribute a sticker. And you can see that that uh, round sticker. Let's sort our waste. Of course, in in the local language, not in English. Um, and that is a device that helps people to self-commit. Yes, I want to separate my waste. And we ask them to put that sticker on the lid of their bin, yeah, the new blue bin that we distributed, put it on that lid to kind of self-commit commit to separating waste. And also to signal to the neighbors, I participate. I want us all to win. Yeah? I make an effort and I separate my waste. So these are the four interventions that we um, developed. Some of them already implemented. Uh, the bins have been distributed. The truck has been redesigned. 
and we are currently um, distributing the flyers and the stickers um, in an experimental design so that we can also rigorously measure the impact of our interventions. Next slide, please. Yeah, so testing and improving, we're currently in that phase. We're testing um, our interventions and testing is important. Yeah, sometimes um, the result can be quite surprising. We had a, a, an experiment in, in Argentina where we tried to use the social argument, um, support the workers in the plant by separating your waste. Um, and that social argument did not help. Yeah, we were quite surprised by that, um, but it, it did not increase separation rates. Um, if anything, it brought them down. Yeah. We don't know the reason for that, but in our case, testing was very important because um, we learned that we rather should not use that argument. Yeah. We tested it against um, other designs of the intervention. So after that, we had certainty, OK, we should choose that design of the intervention and not this design. Yeah. So we, we really think um, testing is important. Also, when we have an intervention that might well, we, we're not really sure whether it will work, maybe not, but it's cheap. So let's try it out. And sometimes we're surprised by the positive results. Um, if we can test different intervention design designs, um, then of course we have a basis for, for decision and we can choose the most effective. <laughs> and the testing is such, um, of course, I mean, the testing that we're doing at the moment um, in the design of a randomized control trial, that is a lot of work and um, it requires quite a bit of expertise. So that's not always possible. Um, there are smaller scale testing methods that can be used. And of course, in every situation, one has to think about how far can we go? Yeah, Not, not all the interventions need to end up as a scientific publication. Um, so sometimes it's it's better to you know do a bit of a, uh, a quick and dirty approach that at least gives you a gut feeling of what uh, impact your intervention has and if you have different designs which work might work best. And then as the last step only, once you've identified an impactful intervention, then you can scale it up on a sound basis. Next slide, please. Now, since we are in a in an event festival that is organized by International uh, Development Corporation, I think it would be um, it, it's a nice uh, idea also to think about what is the role of international cooperation, because I think um, international cooperation has two very key advantages. Um, they have a big network in the partner countries and close contacts with partners on the ground. And that is vital because these partners, I mean, Saka, we've we've seen that again and again, you have the context knowledge. And without that context knowledge, we don't even have to start to try and change behavior. Yeah, so we are, we are just, we have to form a team with the partners on the ground um, and co-develop really the um, the interventions based on the, the very sound context knowledge and of course the behavioral expertise that we can bring in. And um, speaking of bringing in the behavioral expertise, of course that that needs capacity and that also needs finance. Huh? So performing the above steps is of course an investment uh, of time and of money. And this is also where international cooperation can step in as they did in this case. Yeah, financing the additional expertise and enabling the cooperation that we could set up to um, hopefully develop uh, imp impactful and meaningful interventions that contribute to establishing a, a functioning system. Yeah? We think that um, doing that uh, uh, investment in, uh, in all the steps that I just outlined is worthwhile because Otherwise, we risk that we establish a system that does not function, and that is always the, the costlier option. Yeah? So we think it's better to invest uh, early and then get it right from the start and then uh, have, a, have a system that functions also in the longer term and that in that way also is a sustainable system. And I think that was my last slide. So 
Thank you very much.